One common thing that I see a lot of newer dividend investors fall for is yield traps, and that is the process of buying a stock or an ETF just because it has a high yield. That's all you care about is buying the high yield. You're not looking at total return, but more specifically, I have seen this certain category of ETFs, which are known as covered call ETFs, and they tend to bring some of the biggest yield traps that I've ever seen. So in this video, I'm going to talk about why I believe most investors should avoid them. We're going to look at a couple of different things in this video, basically supporting this, we're going to start out by looking at this one Reddit post that talks about JEPI, which is JP Morgan's equity premium income ETF. And they basically explain it at a really nice level of detail and explain why people are just chasing yields and they shouldn't be falling for this. We'll then look at how do covered call ETFs actually make money. And that's probably going to be explained in the Reddit post, but I can elaborate on that a little bit more. Then we'll take a look at the difference between three covered call ETFs. That's going to be JEPI, QYLD and XYLD. And finally, I'm going to analyze covered call ETFs versus an ETF like SCHD or VU, and we're gonna talk about that. So what are your thoughts on these covered call ETFs? Do you own them or avoid them? Why or why not? Comment down below, I'd love to hear. All right, so jumping into this post here, shout out to this person, Easy Durian, to help us out. I honestly just felt like this was the best explanation of why people should avoid it, but let's see what they say. So numerous discussions on this forum have revolved around individuals heavily investing in JEPI within taxable accounts. When the inherent flaws of such a strategy are highlighted, the common responses often entail, well, everyone's financial situation is unique or taxes shouldn't be the primary determinant of investment choices. And those are just two amongst other arguments. And nevertheless, this perspective is misguided and investing in JEPI within a taxable account should be avoided. Allow me to enlighten you on why this is the case. So let's jump into this. So covered calls, let's take a brief overview here. So let's first understand JEPI and the concept of covered call strategy. So a call option offers the buyer a right without an obligation to purchase the underlying asset such as a stock, index, or commodity at a pre-established price at a future date. This right is obtained by paying a premium, and JEPI, on the other hand, is in the business of selling these call options to earn the associated premiums. So in a covered call strategy, the portfolio manager holds an investment in the underlying asset while selling a call on the same asset. If the stock value plummets to zero, the investor's maximum loss would be the value of the stock minus Minus the premium received. This is one way that JEPI manages to lower its overall volatility. Now, on the other hand, the highest payoff happens when the stock price rises just below the call price, where the holder retains the underlying asset and collects the full premium. Any additional increase in the stock price would basically put you at a disadvantage as it would increase the cost of reinvesting in the stock that was called away. The premium of an option depends on various factors, including the time in which it's going to expire. So for example, if an option, if you buy it for let's say 20 bucks on Monday and it expires on Friday and it doesn't become in the money or favorable for you, you will lose that value a lot quicker versus buying a call option that expires six months from now. So the time to expire is one part of it and then the volatility of the underlying asset, prevailing interest rates, the strike price, and the current price of the underlying asset. So there are a bunch of factors that play into the premium of an option. Changes in these factors can affect the premium amount received by JEPI for selling call options. And the fund's goal is to minimize beta exposure and volatility, which means that some factors like time to expiry and out of the Money component remain relatively constant over time. The primary factors affecting the option premium are likely to be volatility and interest rates, which can fluctuate over different periods as we've seen. Now let's talk about the composition of the high yield. So JEPI aims to achieve an annual yield between 6 to 10 percent through a combination of 1 to 2 percent from dividends and 6 to 8 percent from option premium. So you are making most of your money in JEPI from options. Let's be very clear about that. And the remaining return potential comes from variable equity market exposure. The fund is anticipated to perform well in volatile environments and could outperform broader indices during downturns. However, it might underperform during sharp market rallies. So basically it's saying it performs well in volatile environments. So what does that mean? That means if stocks go up 20% one month and they drop 20% the next month. So an environment in which stock prices 
take massive swings back and forth. They're going up in very large amounts or down. And they could outperform broad indexes like the S&P 500, QQQ, you know, some of those guys during market downturns, but it might underperform during sharp market rallies. So if the market goes up three years in a row, there's a good chance that Jeppy will underperform it. The majority of Jeppy's holdings are equity and REIT positions comprising nearly 80 to 85% of the total equity holdings. This portfolio, which has a noticeable underweight in the IT sector and several other sector specific bets, displays a defensive tilt. So basically they're just saying that they're not as tech heavy as some other covered call ETFs or, you know, you get my point there. It's more of a defensive ETF in that regard. The footnote in the prospectus mentions convertible bond sector, but in reality it is exclusively composed of ELNs, which is equity linked notes. I've seen these holdings accounted range from 15 to 20% of the fund by market value and Jeppy's covered call exposure is entirely within the ELNs, which are designed to provide returns linked to the underlying assets within the note. These ELNs are typically contracted for one week and tend to be out of the money. ELNs are investment products that blend fixed income investments with potential returns linked to equities performance. ELNs are essentially contracts with other institutions but generate income and could potentially be a better alternative to covered calls. So Jeppy itself is not directly using covered calls. They're using ELNs. That is one common mistake that people have. So it could potentially be a better alternative to covered calls unless a financial financial crisis leads to defaults on these contracts. About 15 to 20 percent of Jeppy's portfolio is composed of ELNs that generate almost all of its income, which is distributed as monthly dividends. Meanwhile, 80 to 85 percent of the portfolio is made up of high quality blue chip stocks aiming to generate returns. It's important to remember that a key reason for Jeppy's high yield and outstanding return is its use of ELNs. However, if these contracts counterparties default, Jeppy's income could collapse. So that's a huge risk that people don't take into account. Account. Not saying it's likely, but it's just a risk he never sees anyone acknowledging, which I totally get that. Secondly, the ELN income and covered call income are generally taxed at ordinary income rates. Just 15 to 20 percent of Jeppy's dividends are qualified, implying that it's best to hold it in a tax deferred retirement account. And then for high income investors, the effective tax rate for Jeppy could be close to 50 percent if held in taxable accounts. And on top of that, you owe its high annual turnover of 195 percent. So Jeppy's tax implications are significant. Over the past year, 40% of its returns were eroded due to taxes and high turnover related expenses. Now this post was done 10 months ago. So over the past year, if you went back 10 months ago, right? But in conclusion, for wealthy investors in the top tax bracket, the promise of a 6 to 10% return might only yield 3 to 5%. Therefore, even though Jeppy's combination of low volatility blue chip stocks and out of the money ELNs, along with excellent active management, has so far produced remarkable returns, potential investors must be aware of these certain risks. So that basically explains what is Jeppy because that is like the most popular one. So that is one common misconception is people think it's a covered call ETF. It's not exactly, but it's very similar to a lot of the covered call ETFs. It generates its income through ELNs, as I just talked about. It's funny because this person says, I know I'm going to get absolutely gutted with this post, but I can't watch the madness continue. That basically too long didn't read. Tax efficiency matters. Investments and the types of accounts that are held in need to be considered. And after tax returns need to be a metric that should be top of mind. So that basically explains what are covered call ETFs. What is Jeppy? Now let's compare Jeppy versus QYLD versus XYLD. And I actually had ChatGPT explain this to me in just three bullet points. So let's start out with the underlying assets. So Jeppy invests in a selected portfolio of US large cap stocks, as we just discussed. While QYLD tracks the NASDAQ 100 index and, and XYLD tracks the S&P 500 index. Now, when looking at the option strategy, as we just talked about, Jeppy uses their proprietary option strategy involving ELNs, equity linked notes, to generate income, whereas QYLD and XYLD employ straightforward covered call strategies on their respective indices. And finally, if you compare income versus growth balance, Jeppy aims for a balance of income and capital appreciation with lower volatility, while QYLD and XYLD prioritize income generation, which caps upside potential and focuses less on capital growth. So that is the difference between them. Now let's take a look at their three-year return, assuming dividends or distributions are reinvested. So if you look at Jeppy here, that has a total three-year return of 24%. QYLD is at 15% and XYLD is at 13%. The five-year dividend CAGR for Jeppy is at 0% with QYLD 
YLD at negative 3%, XYLD at 7%, VU at 5%, and SCHD at 12%. And looking at their dividend growth history in years, so JEPI, QYLD, and XYLD are all at zero. And the reason for that is because their dividends don't slowly go up over time. If you look at them, they're very volatile and inconsistent. Like, let's take a quick look at this. So if we look at JEPI and we go to dividend history, as you can see on this 10-year chart, which again, we don't have 10 years of data, but since 2020, it's not trending upward at all. It's all over the place. So your dividends aren't steadily going up and to the right. But let's take a look at QYLD. When you look at QYLD, it's literally the exact same thing. In fact, I would argue that the dividends look like they've gone down. They went from 22 cents, 19, 20, 18, all the way down to 17, 18. Yeah, I mean, so pretty much flat. They're down slightly, but for the most part, that is not a clear trend up and to the right. Looks like they did have one large dividend of 50 cents back in 2021, but excluding that, there's no clear trend up and to the right there. Let's take a look at XYLD. Now, XYLD says it has a five-year dividend CAGR of 7%. The only reason it says that, though, is because they had a massive dividend increase from 2020 to 2021. But as you can see long-term, you know, since 2021, it's $4.50, $5.28, $4. There's no consistent growth up and to the right. And you can even see that here in the chart. So like, yeah, you get a really massive dividend occasionally like in 2017. But as you can see, it's not going up. It's not trending upward and to the right. So there's no clear trend here. I mean, their peak dividend that they've had in the last five years looks like it was 50 cents back in 2022. And since then, that has then dropped to 34 cents. So in my mind, I want that dividend income to increase. Now, if you look at VU here, they do have a dividend growth history of only three years. But if you take a look at why, it's mainly just because they come cut their dividend in 2020 by 4.8%. But over a long period of time, if you go to the dividend history, it is trending up and to the right. Like you can see here is at 56 cents, 53 cents, 58 cents. Then it jumps to a dollar and 29, a dollar and 21, a dollar 39. Now it's up at a dollar 80, a dollar 49, a dollar 54. So you can see that is trending upward. It's very clear. And then looking at SCHD, they have a dividend growth history of 12 years. Anyone that owns SCHD or is a big ETF person, especially on the dividend growth side, you guys know this is the main one people love to talk about. Very clear trend upward. I mean, back in 2011, it was 12 cents a quarter, 14 cents, 21 cents, 21 cents. Now it's sitting more around 61 cents, 70 cents, 65 cents. So very consistent increase in trend here. And finally, if we take a look at the dividend yield, yes, JEPI is currently sitting at 7%. QYLD is at 12%. XYLD is at 9%. VU is only at like about 1.3%. And then SCHD is a little bit over 3%. So although JEPI's three-year return does look pretty good, in my opinion, if you believe that the stock market will trend upward over a long period of time, owning something like VU or SCHD is going to be way more optimal for you. And yeah, you can make the argument that hey, well, Jeppy's outperformed SCHD over the past three years, therefore it's a better ETF. And yeah, over three years, you're correct. I guess it has. But if you factor in the tax implications as well as just the long-term volatility of JEPI plus the dividend growth, I think that SCHD will absolutely kill it. I mean, I'm willing to bet a lot of money that over a five to 10 year period, SCHD is gonna give you a lot higher total return. And on top of that, your dividend income will grow pretty steadily. And even when you look at this chart here of JEPI, there's no clear trend up and to the right. I mean, they've been going since 2020, May of 2020, which was a very low point in the market. They were at $50 a share. Now they're only at 57. It's not like it's just absolutely killing it. You'd have to be reinvesting dividends and there's no clear trend up and to the right. And QYLD and XYLD are actually worse if you look at this. So as you can see here, QYLD back in, what is this, 2019 was at $22 a share. And it peaked at, you know, February of 2020, right before COVID at $23. It drops down to, you know, 22, and then it drops down to 19 and then 18. Now it's currently sitting at 17. So had you bought this five years ago, you would have a negative return on your capital appreciation, assuming no dividends were reinvested. And so it almost feels like you're catching a falling knife. Like, yeah, you get a lot of dividend income, but if the stock just keeps falling over a long period of time, is that really worth it? The same thing could be said about XYLD here. As you can see back in 2019, they're at about $48 a share. Then they peak at about 52. They drop, they come back to 51. Then they drop down to 44 and then 41. And now they're sitting at 40. So like if you're not reinvesting dividends, these ETFs are just horrible on your total return. So you may see that juicy yield of nine or 10% or 7% and think, yeah, I got to buy these ETFs. But in my opinion, 
I would much rather own something like VU where over the past five years, it's up 85%. And yeah, that dividend yield's not that high starting out, but it's the market. It's going to do a lot better than a covered call ETF over a long period of time. And even something like SCHD is up 54% over the past five years. So these ETFs, in my opinion, are just no brainers compared to the covered call ETFs. I really don't understand why people buy these, but this is just my opinion. I would really like to hear some of your guys' inputs on that. So feel free to comment that down below. And that is my take as to why covered call ETFs or some of these high yielding ETFs are just total yield traps. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, drop a like down below, hit that subscribe button. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.